Welcome to what is obviously going to be the most romantic session. Um, the best slides. Um, Anthony and I have been colleagues for ever. Um, uh, the difference is he has risen to extreme prominence. <laughs> Certainly as a scholar of Frank Lloyd Wright, but there's a lot more to Anthony than uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. He's also a practitioner, as well as a professor and a historian, um, and very much a, 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 global, a global mind. Now, let me read to you the, the more technical part. Uh, Anthony Lawson, FAIA, architect, historian, author, and professor, recognized one of the world's leading experts on Frank Lloyd Wright, got his mark from uh, the GSD, his PhD in art history and archaeology from Columbia, where he was also the presidential fellow and press fellow. In 2017, he was elevated to College of Fellows of the AIA. He's the author of 12 books and over 100 essays and reviews. His current book, which I'm certainly looking forward to, is called The Ingenious Giant, Frank Lloyd Wright in New York, he published in 2019. Anthony is a member of the International Association of Art Critics, serves as an advisor to several boards, nationally and internationally. He's taught at the School of Art for over 30 years, and he was the director of the center uh, before I was. The subject of organic architecture, for much as to add a few words, as you all know, in this computer age, uh, what Peter Collins called the biological analogy metaphor of buildings being like organisms, or certainly buildings interacting with nature at a biological level, uh, has reached new heights of inspiration. But it's actually a fairly old idea. I'm sure Anthony knows how old. I would guess 200, maybe, since the first time buildings were analogized to natural objects. Frank Lloyd Wright was a, a major proponent of that, and I think Anthony's going to contextualize that and give anyone who's interested in the biological analogy uh, an entirely new insight. So welcome, Anthony. Thank you so much for doing this lecture. Well, thank you, Michael, for that not only a gracious introduction, but actually, in terms of content, uh, a perfect segue to what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But before I um, uh, launch into this discussion of uh, organic architecture, um, we might just ask uh, why the topic itself is of interest. Uh, I would suggest that uh, the interest in organic architecture comes about because sustainability is very fashionable, designing with nature, designing with sites. Um, there's been a rise of interest in uh, metamorphic form, which tends to create volumes that we think of as organic. Uh, there's also been an interest in uh, facades and pattern language, which has an organic component. Uh, this often applies to surface uh, treatments. But I think this topic of organic architecture has some broader suggestions, and one of those is do we need uh, a theory of architecture to uh, generate or at least uh, uh, stimulate it? And if we don't have a theory of architecture propelling our design process, um, then what do we have? Uh, is the creation of architecture just arbitrary, arbitrary and personal? Um, furthermore, this topic suggests does history in any substantive way have anything to contribute? You know, if not, in other words, if history has nothing to even contribute to uh, contemporary design, uh, what's the repercussions of that uh, culturally or psychologically or even uh, spiritually? But if history does have some relevance, how do we uh, harness those uh, insights? Now, as um, As um, Michael uh, uh, suggested, in fact, perfectly, uh, there's a very long uh, history to organicism in architecture. 
and it really goes back uh, to the ancients. Uh, Alberti uh, wrote uh, at length, surprisingly, in his treatises on organic architecture, and it's very interesting to read the full statements, and not just the excerpts of what Alberti had to say. Organic architecture was uh, fundamental to the production of medieval architecture, or even if the processes uh, weren't uh, written <coughs> down, they were passed on from generation to generation through the guild system. Uh, by the 19th century, organic architecture is very much associated with nature, and the analogy between nature and architecture was reinforced with the idea of empathy, that natural forms could create a, an emotional connection between architecture and what we uh, perceive. And nature led in, in two directions. One of them was the one that Michael uh, just mentioned, which we could call a kind of biomorphic organicism. Uh, that relates uh, more to the tradition of mimesis or copying, where forms look like natural forms, or they may be uh, abstracted, um, as we can see uh, in this uh, arguable example of the Tasso House by Victor Corta. <coughs> Or in an example that's a bit sui generis, Casa Bablo by Anthony Gaudi. Now, nature could lead in another direction as well, uh, towards what we might call a deeper examination of its ideas in form and growth that's logical and cellular. And this, these processes in nature are defined by multiplication and division. And this sort of organicism, I would like to call a structural organicism. So on the one hand, we have a, a biomorphic organicism that tends to be a little more literal. And on the other hand, a structural organicism which is less so. Now, the common bond between these two ways of thinking, at least in the 19th century and up to the beginning of the 20th century, was the notion that in nature we could find a guide to transform us, to make a, allow us to transcend the, the depredations of industrialization and return to a kind of pure moment so that <coughs> nature could be a guide to the future uh, of design. Now, the architect uh, most associated with organic architecture uh, in this country and maybe around the world is Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, falling water may be uh, tremendously obvious as an example of Wright's organic architecture. Um, less so, a building like the Second Jacobs House, uh, 1944 in Middleton, Wisconsin, which is a solar hemicycle. It might be one of the first burned houses uh, uh, of modern architecture. But when we look more closely at Wright's uh, design process and at his work, we see a very different treatment from what we saw in Porto's Castle House with all those curves and uh, vegetal forms. Uh, right off the bat, we're seeing something that's more uh, rectilinear and uh, more uh, geometric. Now, Wright was um, potent as an article, as, as an architect, uh, like Le Corbusier, because not only did he practice, but he theorized. He theorized from the very beginning. In 1908, he had the great good fortune of publishing his theories of architecture in the leading professional journal, Architectural Record. And he says, uh, on the first page of this text, he says, uh, nature is our guide, and I'm well aware of the fact that when you call on nature, you could be asking for trouble. It's not so easy as you think. And then he proceeds to spell out his own theory of organic architecture. And I want to just go over this a little bit because uh, it may not be as well known um, uh, as you think. Now, in this first statement in 1908, uh, Wright gives us a series of principles. The first one is simplicity and repose. And simplicity and repose come about 
through six processes. Uh, one of them is to minimize the number of rooms in a building, to integrate openings, eliminate details, build in appliances, incorporate pictures into the building fabric, uh, and build in furniture. And some of these ideas come out of arts and crafts. Wright incorporates them into his theory. This is the first principle with its subparts. The second principle is to make as many styles as clients, which is a very profound notion, because what that says is, because of the individuality of, of, of people, an organic architecture is going to look different depending on uh, who you're dealing with, a uh, site and a program. The third principle follows from that, that buildings should grow from their sites. The fourth principle is very interesting. Wright talks about the conventionalization of color. Of color is something we rarely discuss, but part of his theory of the organic was to abstract a color palette for use uh, in, in, in design process. In other words, you take from the world around you the colors that exist, the colors of nature, and you incorporate those uh, into what you're, uh, what you're building. The fifth principle is to express the nature of materials, a principle that might be very obvious to us. And the sixth was that an organic architecture should demonstrate uh, character and integrity. Now, what's been left out of this picture, right? This is worked out in detail, is much insight into actually how we design. So this is going to be a theme I'm developing here uh, at the outset of this talk. Now, 1931, Wright takes these same ideas and he reorganizes them a little bit um, so that the structure is a little more symmetrical. But by 1939, uh, when he's lecturing in England, he says, and I quote, modern architecture, let us now say organic architecture, is a natural architecture, the architecture of nature for nature. So this notion now is archite organic architecture. It's the architecture of nature. Well, all uh, well and good uh, up to a point. Now, parallel right uh, in these halcyon years of his productivity, in the history of modern architecture, there's a whole lineage of organicism. Uh, we can see it in the work of someone like Hugo Herring in his uh, competition entry for a skyscraper, whoops, sorry, for a, uh, a skyscraper uh, on the Friedrichstrasse. Uh, interesting, interestingly, in this competition entry, uh, the code name for uh, this object, which had, didn't have the architect's and itself was functional form. Now, better known uh, in this mode of organicism in Germany is Erich Mendelssohn, who loved to draw with big pieces of uh, charcoal or uh, crayon. Uh, these drawings were constructed, as we can see in this uh, hat factory in Luchenwald, or in an example like the uh, Schocken department store and Mendelssohn did a series of these. Um, this one was built in Stuttgart. He was perhaps most famous uh, for the Einstein Tower in Potsdam of 1924. Just as an aside, in the following year, he comes to America and he makes a beeline for Frank Lloyd Wright because he identifies Wright as the American equivalent of the organic uh, architect. Now, this lineage of the organic line in modern architecture uh, encounters a, a curious fate, because from the 1920s on, uh, people like Mendelssohn become increasingly marginalized as the functionalist, uh, rationalizing arm of the modern movement takes over. And it's out of that wing that we ultimately get uh, the international style. And ultimately, it becomes the dominant mode, particularly for corporate architecture in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and onward. But this strand of organicism uh, is never fully extinguished, uh, as we can see in the Berlin Philharmonic by Hans Scharoun, uh, which began construction in uh, 1960. 
Uh, there are other organic developments uh, in the evolution of modern architecture in the 20th century. Uh, much less well-known is the Breda Pavilion at the Milan Trade Fair in 1952 by Luciano Baldassare and uh, Marcello Grisotti. Breda was an Italian manufacturing company from the 19th century that started out um, making machinery and ultimately was making armaments and uh, even uh, aircraft. This was one of a number of pavilions, and it reminds us of a kind of a parallel organicism in the 50s, or where amoeboid shapes are finding their way into uh, furniture and, and interiors. Now, by the end of Wright's career in 1957, he revisits the core kernel of his organicism. What now is organic architecture? Design appropriate to modern tools, the machine, and this new human scale. A modern architecture means more or less an organic society. Well, these are um, uh, wonderful ideas. No? I mean, it's, uh, who's going to disagree? This makes uh, great sense. But it doesn't inform us, again, if we're interested in design process. So where his emulators and the legacy of Wright was left was with some options. One could be to imitate Wright's work. Another could be to do your own interpretations. As we see in the work of someone like Bruce Goff from Oklahoma. This is his Ford House in Aurora, 1947. Or Goff's followers like Bart Prince, who lives in Albuquerque and is still very active as a practitioner. This is his Skilton House of Columbus, Ohio, an interior view. You can see how utterly elaborate and woody it is. Um, uh, Prince worked out his ideas of organic form uh, through drawing, uh, as we uh, can observe in the uh, Hannah residence, uh, in um, elevation and, uh, <coughs> section. Now, other uh, followers in the right legacy, like his own son Lloyd, uh, often um, replicated the stylisms of Wright's own organicism. And it was a powerful uh, force. Uh, someone like Faye Jones, whose work you're looking at here, spent the first part of his career literally in that mimetic mode. Um, copying the vocabulary that he understood to be organic. And it's only when Jones starts to move beyond uh, the, the, the imitative phase that his originality and the work that we most uh, appreciate begins to emerge. Another figure who definitely falls into the rubric of the organic architect is John Lautner, who had a long career uh, and received most of his... Uh, international recognition are really towards the end of it. Now, um, Lautner was a Taliesin fellow. He worked under Wright. He learned these <coughs> lessons as best he could. And he developed them uh, with really a powerful fluidity as he explored a whole variety of technologies, uh, particularly cast concrete. As you can see here, <coughs> the Marbrisus residence in Acapulco, of 1973. Now, other architects are interpreting the organic mode. This is the Brenton House by a, a little-known figure named Charles Hurtling. It was designed in 1969. Now, in 1969, uh, there's been a kind of revival of interest uh, in organic form. And it's interesting to note uh, that this coincides with a fundamental cultural shift. This is the time of the Back to the Earth movement, uh, not just in this country, but uh, more broadly, at least in um, Western culture. This is the time of counterculture. Uh, people like yourselves are designing yurts, uh, homemade structures. Uh, there's an interest in Buckminster Fuller, uh, geodesic domes. It's the rise of environmentalism. Um, the notion of organic becomes much more current. If you can imagine, say, in 1971, uh, a, a, a middle-sized or even a large city might have 
one or two specialty stores where you could buy organic food. Uh, now organic food is absolutely ubiquitous. Uh, from the uh, 1980s onward, uh, the interest in an organic architecture um, parallels an interest in alternatives to the international style, uh, which has really, truly run out of gas by this time. Now, the organic mode continues uh, pretty much uh, really up to the present. Uh, this is a fairly recent house by the architect Ken Kellogg, uh, a residence called Desert House uh, in the Mojave Desert of California. And you can see that it incorporates uh, elements of the existing uh, rocky landscape uh, right into the master bath. Now, by the uh, early 90s, uh, we have uh, extremely uh, powerful tools for not only visualization, but for the construction of highly complex uh, volumes. As you can see at the iconic uh, museum uh, in Bilbao, by Frank Gehry, 1991-97. The question is, is Frank, um, is Frank Gehry an organic architect? And is every form uh, that's curving uh, uh, organic? In other words, is the curve itself a signifier? Are visual analogies to nature uh, enough to define all the processes that we need for, for our organicism. And can an organic architecture, in the end, be anything more than a style? Because basically, the production of architecture is a function of the selection of a style. Now, this topic has interested me for a long time. Um, maybe when I started to design as a graduate student at Harvard, uh, it really became pronounced in the mid-1980s when I was um, living uh, at Italias and West and looking at the original drawings of Frank Lloyd Wright and beginning to analyze uh, his design process. And what I began to see in looking um, at the sketches and the kinds of drawings that no one had ever seen or had never been published, is a process that amazingly had a kind of classical dimension because of its ordering system. So what I began to see was that the processes of Wright's design applied not only in plan, but in facade or elevation and section as well. And that those processes, which were all about basic geometry and rotating geometric forms were found in essence in his ornament. And as a historian, I realized that this whole system was the whole history of architecture and always had been right up to the beginning of the 20th century. So we can look at a, at a drawing like the one behind me from 1521 by the architect Cesare Cesariano for the facade of Milan Cathedral, a medieval building that didn't have a front. So the challenge was, what kind of modern facade are we going to put on a sacred building? And what the architect does is he takes a, pro a series of definable logical processes of rotating geometry, formally it's called quadrature, and uses that to generate one form within the other. Each form is absolutely logically produced, which is what you need to produce a pure and sacred architecture. And he makes it very clear because at the top of the drawing, he writes it out in Latin and he said, uh, the iconography of this geometry is the iconography at the highest level. And he describes uh, how these things are put together. <coughs> These processes, uh, which are contained in Wright's ornament as a kind of seed germ, can be found uh, all over the globe and throughout time. This is a plate of ornament, surface ornament, uh, from um, a Japanese book printed in Germany that Wright bought in 1909 that I found in his library. Because Wright's <coughs> studying these patterns not to copy them, 
but to look at the underlying geometric process. He also did this uh, with woodblock prints and other things. So to get at this issue a little more deeply, in 2005, I um, set up a collaborative a project with the Experiential Technology Center at UCLA, a um, visualization laboratory, which had been doing some really extraordinary three-dimensional uh, reconstructions, particularly of classical sites, but they had uh, very uh, they had several teams of um, people working on these things and a great big visualization portal. Now, we had one of these portals at UT just down the hill, but I thought it would be um, a great idea to do this in collaboration with another university. Uh, we were funded uh, by the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in Fine Arts, and I saw when I was at UCLA this object <clears throat> behind me, this plate of Lewis Sullivan's ornament from the Gage Building of 1898. The Gage Building was a store that sold hats and millinery. And what I did with uh, the team in UCLA was to do a series of uh, analyses where, in effect, we reverse engineered uh, that design. And we found an underlying matrix and the underlying geometries, which turned out, in essence, to be rather straightforward, uh, squares with squares uh, inside squares, rotated squares, from whose centers um, vectors would be projected out one by one, all systematically, and we wrote down these moves. We wrote down the rule system uh, by which uh, we, inter we interpreted Sullivan made these forms. In Sullivan's work, which is very vegetal, there are almost always circular elements. Um, these are represented by the imposition of a series of, of circles each one rationally placed uh, in the arrangement. Then we began to extrude uh, these two-dimensional shapes, and this is what Wright understood was the power of this system. He knew that Sullivan didn't understand that, and he, sp he said so, but he saw for, for himself that this was the, the, the fundamental revolution of his spatial thinking. So this is not just a mechanical process, because you as the creator can intervene by subtracting or adding pieces and parts of a module like this. Now, this was one module. <coughs> Sullivan had put several of them together. So we took these modules and we assembled them in a matrix. And then we projected this matrix into this great visualization portal, which you walked into a kind of virtual reality uh, experience to see what it was like to be inside a space that had been rationally produced by a rule system uh, derived from a plate of ornament from 1898. Does that make sense? So it was really um, uh, a, uh, quite an exciting experience. It may seem a bit quaint today, but imagine this is 2005, 2006, uh, and I think fairly innovative in terms of the technology available um, at the time. We presented this uh, in Chicago uh, at the uh, Graham Foundation, which had uh, funded, funded our, our research. Now, all of that had come from uh, this uh, object. Now, the same analytical processes that I've been describing to you, this, this rule system that we derive, can be applied to uh, any organic forms of nature, uh, from roses uh, to crystals. And rule systems like this, uh, which are nothing but a series of algorithms, are perfectly applicable to these amazingly powerful visualization tools uh, that we have now. So I'm proposing today that if we did that, we would have a true organic architecture based on logic, on theory, and on connections of nature, uh, instead of just uh, copying nature or doing something like the 19th century with um, art for uh, art's sake. 
So consequently, one wonders um, about the relationship between this uh, piece of blob architecture, which actually is 30 million years old, a uh, concretion of sandstone uh, that sits in the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Uh, what's the dialogue between it and this uh, form that was published uh, on Monday, a design by the firm Stoheta uh, for the Norwegian um, uh, uh, artist um, Bjorn, uh, uh, I'll get Bjorn's name here in a second. Slip. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, sorry, Bjorn uh, Melgard. Actually, yeah. Melgard did the sketches. He's a very controversial artist. This is his own home called A uh, Place uh, to Die In. And, uh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, he handed the sketches over to Snohetta. Uh, they produced this design, which was described, and this is the important point, as a black crystalline UFO. So my question to you is, is there a dialogue between the white crystalline form on the one hand, uh, with its longevity, and the black crystalline form of uh, Monday? Thank you very much. <laughs> well, wow, what a very provocative lecture. Let's um, let's pile in here. Questions? Anyone? Let's <clears throat> see if I can. The, the, the notion of ra rationalizing or using uh, patterns in order to organize space or organize compositions in general uh, and its relationship with the uh, organicism is I, what I believe uh, is what you are uh, proposing here in one extent, right? <clears throat> on the other hand, what we are looking there on the left side, right, of the purely of organic form, is something that cannot be a, a, a framed within this notion of order that those patterns or, or those patterns create. It's, 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 it is true that perhaps if we uh, use that, uh, we look at that piece and we do a 2D representation of it and we start trying to find those patterns, we will find them, right? But is it actually true that that's how organicism works or, or organic, uh, everything that is organic works. I mean, there are several uh, ways of, in which uh, uh, this notion of how the universe or everything within this universe is organized or is, 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 is controlled by those geometries. There have, been, there have been any other efforts like Georgie Doxy's book that tries to create a universal pattern for everything, right? Or this movie by uh, <clears throat> Aronofsky, The Pie, The Order of Cows, that talks about stock market or stuff. So I, I, I'm kind of curious about what you think about that notion of, on one hand, these patterns that claim or look at how things that are that aim to organize what organic is, but on the other hand, when organic means no order or chaos, if there is no chaos. there is chaos, right? If there is no rule that actually could um, uh, frame uh, what means. To well, well, I would argue that that. Organic always implies some ordering system that, that the obverse is chaos. But I think there are sort of two um, lines of thought implicit in, it, in, you, in, your, in your suggestion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I could sort of clarify because they get it, the intention of my little talk here. And one is, is more fundamental, and that has to do with what generates our design process. When you, des when you design, why are you making the forms you're making? And for 2,000 years in the Western tradition, uh, there was a justification for designing what you designed, which was the core of, of, of the classical idea. So the issue these days is what motivates you design, to design what you're designing? And often I would think that it's 
just an unconscious process where um, students are imitating their professors and professors are imitating images in magazines and, and there is no generative theory um, um, applicable. So does one need a theory or is it really truly more arbitrary? That's sort of an extreme position, but I'm throwing it out there. Or are there other kinds of um, generative processes that are driving design that may be more uh, mechanical or more um, uh, environmental? Um, or is it, in the end, really um, personal taste? Uh, uh, that's why I included the work of Frank Gehry, because uh, if you study his work and you listen to what he says, uh, he has no theory of architecture. On the other hand, you can read the writings of someone like Patrick Schumacher, who was really the genius behind the production of, of the, the Zaha Hadid Enterprise. He writes a lot. He theorizes. And I remember reading something that totally amazed me when he said, I want to talk about our design process. Well, we went to lunch and we had Indian food and there were these crumpled up wrappers in which the papadums came and we, I saw this crumpled up piece of paper and I thought, my God, that's the source of our next design. So there was the key point for a whole creative process. So I guess it's a, a kind of theory. Mm -hmm. So one, one side of the issue is, do, do we need theory? Do we need a theory to generate architecture? Mm -hmm. And what, what are we doing if we don't have a theory? And then the second point is about people who've looked at overall generative systems. Um, architecture, when it used theory, theory was always by analogy. So if you go back to the ancients and the correlation with the Greeks between um, music and architecture, there's an analogy between music and sound and the production of architecture. And the basis of these analogies generally are that if you're produce, making something that has an analogy in nature, it's more harmonious and almost has a kind of transcendent dimension. Mm -hmm. So for Cesare, he's got to use this geometric system of quadrature because it creates a correlation between these little feeble efforts of our mortal hands and the, the celestial dimension. So if you believe that form can be a way of getting a connection to something that's transcendent, that is cosmic or spiritual, then these appeal, then the, then the idea of, of systems or golden sections of proportions mm -hmm. has a kind of a way. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Go ahead. Isn't the current design fad process of parametricism fulfilling what you suggest already? Well, my question is what if we, we go into specifics and we look at a, a parametric design by X, Y, or Z individual, um, what are the generative factors in, in creating the design? And I often don't know what they are, and they're often not revealed. And I don't know even if they're there, because these tools are so powerful. We know you can press a button and you're you have a three-dimensional form that's generated. And through a whole series of processes, you can start manipulating the form and shaping it, which is pretty much, I suspect, how this house to die in was created. A, a personal interpretation. So is, is there anything beyond the personal that's generating those forms? In other words, implicit here is a risk that our technology has presented us with that ironically is sending us back to the 19th century, where it's just like, I like this shape, I'm going to punch it in here, I like that shape, and um, it, it's fine. So um, I think that's my question for parametric design, uh, is what is generating it? I think people are getting more serious about this. And um, just in December, in of all things, the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians, uh, there was an architect uh, from Woodbury uh, University in Southern California who, who wrote a review uh, of um, organic processes uh, um, coming out of, of Rhino. They used the full time. 
rhinoceros C point C point five or something. Mm -hmm. So people are starting to think about and look more closely at <coughs> this issue, but I think that's just begun. Yes. I think uh, like an underlying theme like this kind of interest from your presentation is like like the theme of imitation. And I guess like I guess I would like your opinion on like to what extent is organic architecture like imitation or is that just like is is architecture itself imitation? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well the there are uh, what I proposed was that there are people who are imitative. I mean, there's always been this idea of if we imitate nature, we're, we're doing something that's organic and we're in sync with these natural forces I was just describing. But almost always, we can't compete with nature. Uh, the results are, are never as uh, powerful or as moving as, as nature itself. And all we need to do is just take a stroll outside or pick up a flower or look at something and realize it's humbling. So the imitation of uh, form has always been a sort of challenge, and this is sort of fuel for the whole thrust of uh, the history of modern architecture was imitation just led us to absolute emptiness. <laughs> imitation of classical forms, imitation of all, imitation is going nowhere. <coughs> it seemed that people were happy with imitation, but suddenly we needed something more in a modern age. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at these two images, and uh, it's sort of leading me towards this train of thought where I'm thinking, uh, seems like you're apply organist, something that's sharply organic implies, effectively, you're giving up control to some degree. But then when I look at, and, and that's what I really see in the image to the left, but I look at the image to the right, you know, there's, like that thing has got to be constructed in a way. And I'm thinking in my head, most means of construction, which is inevitably paired with architecture, construction itself is very inorganic. So to bridge something like that on the, on the left with something that's inherently, as an architecture, must be constructed, um, what I'm getting is I do believe that just the mere fact that you know, architecture, we have to construct it, there's a degree of loss of the pure organicism of something when you throw in that requirement? Or can you think of like a purely organic, like an organic method of construction? Because I, I, I'm struggling with that. I don't think the fact of constructing something uh, is an impediment to, to its organic essence. And mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that we love about architecture is the, is the pleasure of making it. Sure. And um, it's just, you know, absolutely amazing what we can do uh, with the, the tools that we have, um, whether it's three-dimensional, four-dimensional milling or 3D printing or whatever. The, the issues of construction are sort of dissolving. Um, that's why I think that this question of what's driving design becomes even more important. Because we don't have to worry about, I mean, Look at that. We, we know it can be built. We don't have any idea how. They don't have any idea how, but we know it can be built. I mean, Frank Gehry had no idea how to build Bilbao Museum. He never could have done it. All those fantastic engineers in Spain figured it out, right? They're the ones who should get the credit. So <laughs> construction, you know, is a, is a pleasure. It, but it's sort of like cooking, you know, it's like when you, when you do a lot of it, it just sort of uh, all works itself out and you sit at the table and and enjoy, and I think we're more and more sitting at the table. You know, thank you for your talk, Anthony. It's, um, you know, I, as you know, I think about this stuff too a, a lot. And, and you know, when, when Wright got this playing cat and mouse with Mike Wallace on those TV interviews, and, and you know, Wallace is pretending not to understand Wright, what organic is, and Wright kind of says, well, you know, he says like, well, Call it wholeness or something, you know, that, that suits you better. And I, I'm really intrigued by this thought you put out there. If you want to talk about and use the word organic architecture, do we need to make that word really as powerful as we would like to have an analogy 
dimension in it? Or is it simply the same thing as wholeness or consistency? So that, let's say, you know, anybody could create a, well, not anybody, but one could create a system that is internally cons consistent to, you know, to, to operate. And um, it, with that by definition, if you, when you create such a thing, a set of rules that you carry out, you know, faithfully and that generate the thing, I think the three-dimensional component is really, you know, since architecture is that, is, is, is critical, it's got to work in 3D. Um, is that sufficient to be able to use an organic label or, or not? For me, um, I get nervous about saying, wanting to use the word organic, you know, for something that's say based on a, uh, a, a say a basic Pythagorean geometry, you know, system you know, <coughs> with, within that, which is in a sense an abstraction, <coughs> a medical abstraction by which we try to understand some aspect of the world, but it's, it's a construct. Um, and I could do that without trying to be conscious of making an analogy to uh, some deeper ways of the world in the way that, say, a Sullivan or a Wright, you know, certainly you know, thought about them. So do you have a sense, or, or do you just want to bounce it back to us, um, you know, to argue about when is, when is it really effective to use the word organic as opposed to saying, find some other synonym, synonym uh, for, for consistency or, or, or wholeness of conception, uh, which is different than, say, an arbitrary set of, of moves that you then jury-rig you know, together to make it work, which, you know, if you want to be cruel, you can say it's Frank Gehry at Bill Bow, um, instinctive, beautiful, but you know, what, what is the logic? Uh, so, I don't know, do you want to play with that one or just throw it back? And, um, <laughs> if you can follow up. Well, um, <laughs> if I... Uh, Hot potato. If I understand that, I think what you're implying, Richard, is that uh, <coughs> the, the term organic, it, it's just thrown around so much and so broadly mm -hmm. that yeah. it could just encompass sort of everything, which is a little bit what I was suggesting with these uh, at the beginning of this talk, that it... In my, so there's the idea of organic is, is pure, like whole foods and, and uh, yeah. architecture and without pesticides. Architecture without pesticides, <laughs> exactly. And but it's that's just like saying talking about modern architecture. It's it's so broad, and um, so it's a kind of uh, uh, tag that that works. But I. Per, per, Myself, I'm interested in, um, for whatever reasons, I'm not sure, in a kind of more disciplined way of, yeah. of making things. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just in part because I'm sort of curious. Not only in part because I'm curious, but because by working in a way that has a systematic approach versus a kind of arbitrary, just I want to do something that's whole, that... Um, that ties in with the whole tradition of architectural practice <clears throat> that was ruptured uh, only 100 years ago, or maybe 150 years ago. And maybe that's, that's just a, roman that's a romantic notion on my part, but how nice to think that my design process uh, actually uh, is part of a long tradition uh, in history over a long period of time. And um, um, thinking about... Uh, Thinking about this uh, is gives me a certain pleasure, so it's a sort of personal yeah. thing. But uh, the whole, just the general rubric, it becomes so broad that, yeah. and this is what so, Wright did. And what I thought I thought you might be asking is why would Frank Lloyd Wright have talked in such generality? Yeah, well, that's an interesting thing about why. Yeah, when he did become very, very, you know, general, you know, say, well, uh, you know, okay. I don't, I'm not talking about a slab of meat in the butcher store. Got that. That's not about the first example that you showed of copying nature. And right was always about some deeper structure. For him, the, I've always believed, and you know, we could argue about this maybe, right thought there, there's a deeper reason for doing this than simply to create a pleasing form in itself, you know, as a pure art, so sake. And so is that deeper reason the thing that's needed to have organic thinking as opposed to say a purely instrumental 
uh, method of generating form that's internally consistent, logical, and everything, but it's just arbitrary in a sense, and, and you, you treat it as arbitrary. Well, that's a great point because it's not so well known, but in fact, <coughs> what I thought about basic geometric shapes as having symbolic resonance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the truth is, for he he was he believed in archetypes, and so architecture had this spiritual dimension. That's why it was important to him. Yeah. And talking about that made him seem like uh, on the fringes. So sometimes he talked about it, wrote about it. He wrote about it in this book, in, little book in 1912 called The Japanese Print. But then to not seem like a weirdo, he sort of suppressed that. The last book he wrote about, he came back to these ideas. So for Wright, there is this kind of, like in the old days, a kind of cosmic dimension. Yeah. Architecture is powerful, yeah. not just because it's orderly, but because it has a kind of... So I think the, really the main reason to imitate nature is because in the first place you divinize nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so without referring to the authority of God, you uh, refer to the authority of nature, which nature now stands in yes. mm -hmm. for God. So to be like nature is to be like God in a way. <coughs> the, the, but the problem, as you point out, is that nature embodies everything from geological forms, which leads to crystallographies and that level of structure, it, it happens at different scales. So people who are interested in new material science and biomimicry are for waterproofing and glass, micro, micro biomimicry, that's also an appeal to nature. And it stretches all the way through organisms to the whole ecologies. So the people who think of buildings as landscapes or as ecologies, um, as, you know, does a building have metabolisms? I mean, it's just such an incredibly wide field of application that um, it's, it's, it's the work of a, a generation of scholars to really parse it out uh, and look at it. So for me, it goes beyond geometry, I have to say. The other thing I would only add is uh, I find it interesting to think about the processes of nature are evolutionary. And since evolution consists of um, reproduction with variation plus selection, like any process that tracks that process will produce something natural. Because that's how nature produces, through evolution, divinized or not. And I actually think that the design process in the human mind is, is evolution speeded up. So when you, when you think of options and sketch them and trace over them and make mistakes, you have to make mistakes, and then realize the mistake is better than the thing you first thought of and then seize on that, and then replicate that, and make more mistakes. And then you are, in fact, going through an evolutionary cycle. And that is what makes what you do like nature, in that you've actually internalized. The, so in other words, evolution speeded up looks like design, and design slowed down looks like evolution. There's really no conflict between them. It's a, it's a scale and time issue. Um, but that's a very abstract way to look at nature. It's a very abstract way to look at the biological metaphor. And it may or may not end up with organic holes or crystallographies or, or what have you. It's a very vexed and amazing question to me anyway. I think because we want to offload intentionality. We don't want to be the boss of design. We just want to sort of shepherd things into existence. Well, that, that's, that's the issue, though. I mean, the intentionality. We, 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 we cl people claim that, yeah. but then when you, when, if you're honest and you mm -hmm. ask, ask what it is that architects do, one might argue just the opposite. That in fact, what they want to do is the most intentional, intentional. thing of all yeah. uh, and identify it with themselves. Right, so they come up with ideologies that allow the problem to seem to emerge, mm -hmm. uh, for things to seem to, like plants, grow of themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry, did I hug the, anyone yeah. else? Francesca. Yeah. Um, in the beginning of, the, this is a small thing, in the beginning of the talk you said that organicism goes back to antiquity and Alberti talked about it in the Gothics. And then in the 19th century it became something more specific in a sense. Could you go over that again? Because I... I didn't quite catch what is different in the 19th century from what is different. 
from what was going on before? Well, um, I, went, I did an uh, etymological study of, of, of organicism and the organic to see uh, it, the first time it starts to appear. Uh, in any textual form, which is why I say it goes, it goes way back, and it's very, and, it, and the use of the term itself has uh, um, a variety of applications, um, and obviously one that I didn't really mention was the, the, what, what is organic chemistry, you know, structure that's based on carbon atoms and so forth. So there are these, so over time, the, the term organic is used in a variety of ways. Alberti talks about, about the organic and, and ornament uh, as being the things that define the special character of cities, um, which is fascinating. So my comment about the 19th century was a little more general, which actually bears on what Michael was just saying, that there's this kind of swelling in the 19th century that's very broad, where one of the results of, not without being too reductive, of, of industrialization is this replacement of, of the deity with, with capital and nature. Mm -hmm. And this is just so ingrained, certainly into the, the ideology of, of somebody like Frank Lloyd Wright, that... There's also uh, Linnaeus organizes nature by types and so forth, and then Durand does the same. Yes. Right? So this is, nature has a pattern. You can basically lay out all the possibilities. And, um, and you see that it's in, all the, in, the, in the middle of the 19th century in, in someone like Owen Jones, who, who, uh, who argued, who did these beautiful folios, a grammar of ornament. But the important thing was not the beautiful pictures, which people copied, but the, but the rules at the beginning, the precepts, where he says, don't copy these forms abstract them. He used the term conventionalization, which Wright used. Mm -hmm. Of course, McCorpenzie also studied the same book. But what he was arguing for was a kind of organic architecture based on nature, where you weren't copying, wasn't the mimetic mode, uh, but an abstracted mode. Mm -hmm. And what I was suggesting was, so you would have someone like William Morris, uh, and this is all happening at the same time with Linnaeus yes. and, and Darwin, um, doing these abstracted forms, but the structural side of things, which I think is the Wrightian mode, was far more abstract and more rectilinear, and more along the lines of crystallography and so on. So I think this is, you know, like... But, you know, people who buy a Bruskoff house or, you know, just have a fantasy about living among rocks under gigantic jungle leaves and so on and so forth, they, you know... It's like that's on the reception side. They don't care that it's actually metal, that no leaf could be that big and be that stiff, you know, uh, that there's high-tech sealants used to keep it waterproof. The, fa the fantasy is to live in Eden, naked, you know, uh, in a totally benign nature, like a, like a bird in a nest, you know, like a, like a baby in the woods. And architecture is just supposed to make that possible by whatever means, you know. It's a kind of a return to nature as a as yes. a, as a yes. romantic fantasy. Yes, yeah. the empathy thing. Yeah, yeah. there yeah. because empathy but, uh, doesn't you doesn't care about the means necessarily. But you want do you want to exclude that? Like, oh, that's just not really natural. No, I, uh, my I'm just more I'm just curious about um, the potential benefits of of a more disciplined. Yeah. Rationalizing approach because I'm a sensualist. I like, yeah, I, I like those kinds of environments. I'm not sure I would like to live in a Bruce Goff house, <laughs> but um, the question is, take a vacation. What what's generating his design? But it, 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 it's it's a kind of personal taste. Yeah. So, okay. Last last question, and then we'll close it. To some degree, personal taste and arbitrary choices are inherent in architecture because if I do architecture for a certain client, I have the personality of that client, the fact that he has only one leg, the mm. fact that uh, to have to. he has a wife and he likes fancy cars and so on, which no matter which 
organic principle I use to generate the form, that part has nothing to do with it. And, <clears throat> and so it can never be a completely coherent organicism. Well, exactly. The definition of art. That, that's why I mentioned in showing the little movie that there's a, a lot of personal aesthetic and, uh, intervention yeah. to make something artful. Exactly. That's, that no machine is ever going to do that. But it, just to conclude, of course, you, know, you just issued a little bit of anti-modernist blasphemy. Oh. Uh, because you know what the whole modern movement of the 20th century wanted to do was to eliminate those uh, personal uh, arbitrary um, selections so that mm -hmm. the universal and collective would be served all for the betterment of humanity which as we can see we've benefited from uh, immensely yeah <laughs> good comment thank you, thank you. Thank you all.